So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we can start the recording. My name is Francesco Billari, and I'm professor of demography uh, and dean of faculty at Bocconi. And I have the privilege to be the moderator of this uh, exciting event. I'm excited because uh, as a demographer, I'm aware that demographic change is one of the great mega trends at the global level, at the national level, at the local level. <clears throat> Actually, any level we can think of. Uh, the main long-term trend is the so-called demographic transition. And we are uh, fortunate to have uh, Ron Lee from University of California, Berkeley, who is the world leading expert on the demographic transition among other issues to be our discussant. The demographic transition is the secular trend towards longer lives and fewer births, and it's pervasive across societies. It also brings big changes, not only in population numbers, but in the composition of population. For a while, the demographic transition brings a window of opportunity with a rising share of the working age population. Then it turns into population aging. This is actually the great demographic reversal uh, that is basically the starting point of the thought-provoking book of Charles Goodhart from the London School of Economics and Political Sciences and Manoj Pradhan from Talk Talking Heads Macro, our main speakers. So before we start, uh, I, let me inform you that in accordance to uh, general privacy regulations, the webinar will be recorded and made available on the EGR website and on the YouTube channel Unibocconi. This will allow users, even those who could not attend this seminar, to enjoy the content of the event at any time. The recording in terms of video of the event will concern the speakers and only those participants who have voluntarily requested to intervene in order to raise questions. And please, uh, you can do it forward. Uh, now let's get to the main speakers. So what are the multiple economic consequences of demographic change, and in particular of this great reversal? Of course, you need to read the book, the full book, to get a full answer. But to start with, let me have the pleasure to introduce and give the floor to Charles and Manoj. The floor is yours. You can start your presentation. Francesco, thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be here, to be with you. Um, and I'd just like to emphasize that we are macroeconomists rather than demographers. And although demography plays a very large role uh, in our book, we tend to look at it from the macroeconomic viewpoint. And I'd like to start by giving you a diagram that shows uh, the history of long-term interest rates in the UK. And you can see how the last 70 years since about 1950 have really been quite extraordinary. Uh, over the previous two and a half decades since 1700, uh, in, interest rates, both short and long, inflation and inflationary expectations had all been relatively stable. Uh, this was largely because the only major use of public sector expenditures and the fiscal deficit was wartime and wars were blessedly temporary. And after wars, governments effectively ran on the whole balanced budgets while the monetary system was anchored by the gold standard um, for most of this particular period. Then in, from starting in the post-war world, post -war world uh, from about 1950 onwards, uh, using Keynesian demand control techniques, the authorities uh, were able to control primarily through fiscal policy. It was a period where fiscal fiscal policies dominated monetary policies, were able to control uh, the pressure of demand in the economy. And most of the those in authority at that time had been brought up during the disastrous period of the interwar recession and were keenest to ensure that unemployment was held as low as feasible. Unfortunately, they held unemployment below, if you like, the equilibrium natural rate, and we got ever increasing 
uh, inflation until it got broken by Paul Volcker uh, at the end of 1979-1982. And from then on, monetary policy became a great deal better with central bank independence and inflation targets. However, the decline in inflation, the decline in nominal and real interest rates, both the short and the long term, were not only caused by the much improved monetary policy regime. And you can show that because during these years in which uh, inflation and interest rates were coming down, um, it wasn't awfully difficult for central banks to achieve their inflation target. They didn't have to push interest rates up at all. The, in the background, something else was disinflating the economy. And that became increasingly obvious after the great financial crisis, the GFC in 2008-2010, when in the decade or so after that was over, despite the central banks throwing everything they could the kitchen sink at trying to restore uh, inflation back to its target of 2%, they weren't even able to do it. So something else in the background was disinflating the system. And our uh, basic thesis is that this was a combination of globalization and demography. Let me take globalization first. Uh, on the left-hand chart, the blue line reflects the uh, number of the working age population in the advanced economies, the developed system, uh, over this period. The yellow line it shows the number of working age population in those countries that joined the world's trading system, notably China and Eastern Europe during this period. And because China, China is so absolutely vast, effectively this meant that uh, the available labor force, which initially for the high wage advanced economies was only the blue line, became the blue plus the yellow line which effectively meant that the available working labor force of working age population uh, more than doubled uh, during the course of 30 years from 1980 to 2010. There has never ever been such a positive, huge positive labor supply shock as this that the world has ever seen. The nearest to it that I can think of historically was the reverse was the bubonic plague in the 14th century, which decimated, cut by sometimes of up to a half the working age population, which led, of course, in the, that to a very sharp rise in real wages. While naturally, the ability to shift production from the high wage to the low wage economies uh, tended uh, to lower real wages in the advanced economies. Uh, it led to disinflation, obviously, through at least three sources. Uh, the first source is that if you shift uh, production of goods from high wage to low wage, those goods become cheaper. Secondly, the very threat that unless wages are held back, uh, we're going to shift, we're going to shift our, our factories uh, from where they are uh, to Hungary or the Czech Republic or China, uh, was a credible threat and reduce the power of the trades unions. And private sector trades unions membership fell steadily during this particular uh, period. Thirdly, it shifted the um, share of uh, production in advanced economies from manufacturing to services. And labor in the service sector is very much less well organized than it is in the manufacturing sector. So during these 30 years, effectively, the bargaining power of labor got trashed. On the right hand side, you can see uh, how the growth of the working age population increased uh, rapidly from year to year. But it was not just uh, the, if you like, the uh, arrival of low wage but effective economies into the world's trading system uh, that led to the disinflationary uh, context. It was also demography itself. Um, and there are a number of features in demography. If we could have the next slide, please, Manoj. Uh, here you see that the dependency ratio, uh, uh, less so in the advanced economies, very strongly in the developed economies, and particularly in China, uh, was declining really very sharply over these 
years to about 2010, after which it starts rising again uh, really quite sharply. And again, on you see this uh, from country by country on the right hand side. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? Um, now, during these years, the share of the working age population uh, was growing quite rapidly because the decline in the proportion of the young um, after about 90, from about 1945 to 55, there was the baby boom. Then that declined really quite sharply. So that the proportion of the young uh, from 1970 to 2010 uh, decreased really very sharply everywhere. Um, and the uh, fertility rate has gone down below the sustainable rate, below 2.1 to about 1.7, 1.9 in virtually all the advanced economies, including China. Meanwhile, the increase in life expectancy was growing less rapidly in all uh, our economies here, except for Japan. Um, and that effectively meant that the share of the working age population was growing very rapidly. Uh, but it was not only the share of the working age population was growing. The other feature was that a combination of the decline in the birth rate, uh, prompted in part by the availability uh, of birth control, uh, the pill, together with the availability of consumer durables, washing machines, refrigerators, et cetera, et cetera, meant that uh, it would, the, the, it, the share of the working age population, which were women, now entered, became workers, where previously they had done homework, which did not count towards GDP. Now they shifted to actually being part of the uh, of workers as well. So you can see from this chart, the share of females in, um, in, in, who were participating in the labor force uh, was rocketing up um, uh, during these years. So it's not only that the working age population was growing, but that the share of workers participating in the workforce uh, of those of working age population uh, was rising uh, e even faster. So it was a huge demographic dividend during this particular period. Now, workers are, will inevitably be paid less than you expect the value of what they produce, otherwise you wouldn't hire them. Uh, and that means uh, that the more workers there are, will also have to save out of their, their incomes for their retirement, that the more workers there are as a share of the population, uh, the less inflationary the system will be. On the other hand, the young, and the old uh, consume, but they don't produce, and therefore they are inflationary. And that is particularly true of the old uh, in the advanced economies, uh, where their consumption are very largely financed out of the public sector in the form of medical assistance, care homes, and what have you, uh, or it increases. It's not actually true that once you um, Sort of reach the age of about 20, your life cycle consumption is steady over the whole period. In the advanced economies, because of the need for care and medical assistance, it actually goes up at the end, whereas the young are relatively less, uh, consume relatively less apart from, from uh, education. So on we go to the next. Um, and the situation is getting unfortunately worse. Um, and it's getting worse because there are a set of crippling diseases which are almost entirely specific to the old. Um, these are in particular the various forms of dementia, uh, Parkinson's, um, uh, on which despite the enormous medical advan advances there have been in dealing with cardiovascular and cancer, there's really been no similar advance whatsoever in dealing with neurodegenerative diseases. And at the proportion of those uh, who have neurodegenerative diseases um, sort of increases almost exponentially with, it, with, with age. 
you are extraordinarily unlucky if you get a neurodegenerative disease before you're 65, before you retire. With each decade that you remain alive, the percentage of those who need medical assistance, who are medically dependent, uh, rather than, e than in the sort of the macroeconomic definition of dependency, which is simply age, who are actually medically dependent, who need assistance to undertake the normal activities of daily living, or ADL as it's known, um, sort of increase steadily with, with age. Um, and uh, the proportion of the oldest old uh, who are going to need such support is if they, they are the fastest growing share of the total population. You can see the table below. You can see that the percentage increase uh, from 2000, uh, over the 20 years from 2015 to 2035, those over 85 in the UK are going to double. Um, and the share of those <clears throat> with medium and high dependency medical dependency <clears throat> is going to go up uh, three times by for the medium um, and sorry it's going to increase by about uh, double for the, for their uh, for the really old um, and that's going to in, involve a huge amount of extra uh, need for care uh, and medical support which our societies really have not yet uh, even begun to address uh, okay, on to the next, please. Uh, this simply shows that the prospects, uh, because of aging, uh, is going to be that the prevalence of dementia in our societies, uh, together with Parkinson's, <coughs> is going to rise uh, really quite significantly. Um, okay, on to the next. Um, <clears throat> what this is going to do is it's going to knock down household savings rates. Um, because the old will have to disave uh, in order to pay for their care. Um, alas, uh, both Manoj and I know this all too well for ourselves. Um, and the proportion of the uh, older, the 65 plus, the population uh, in our society is going to be increasing uh, really steadily and sharply uh, over this period. On to the next. Um, and uh, this has meant, uh, as the burden of the aging population has already been increasing, uh, that pension benefits have already been starting to fall. And that has meant that pre-retirement participation has already been rising quite sharply. Uh, so uh, the idea that we can deal with the increasing proportion of the aged by increasing participation uh, is somewhat dubious because we've already done a lot of the increasing participation uh, of all that. And the sort of the underlying thesis of sort of this part and globalization and demography uh, is effectively that we're, we've got a massively aging society uh, and that policies uh, really have not yet uh, begun to tackle that. And I'm now going to turn over to Manoj uh, to take you through some of the macroeconomic uh, implications uh, for fiscal, monetary, and other policies that, that this will bring with them. Manoj. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charles, and thanks to our hosts uh, for giving us a platform to air our views. Um, I, 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 I take on this presentation at a part where Charles has really laid out the case so clearly that it makes my job easier. Just a couple of things to point out from the crisis of caring. One of the questions that we get on a very regular basis is that uh, you know, a lot of the displacement that comes out of technology, the point that Charles made was so important because what, what, what the UN population statistics gives us is these dependency ratios, but they don't split that into the proportion of people who will increasingly look after the elderly and hence can produce a consumption good that will not be repaid because the elderly will not go back to work. So in some senses, those demography numbers in an economic sense uh, are far more severe unless we can find some absolute productivity miracle, uh, which a lot of people claim is around the corner. 
Now, the effect of all that Charles has said is that despite uh, reducing the burden that the governments had uh, in one of the charts that Charles showed, I think what, uh, what you could see was that the pre-retirement cohort has already moved its participation in the labor market higher in anticipation. On the right-hand side, um, I'm trying to show you that despite retirement age itself uh, rising only very slowly, people have increased their effective age of retirement, which is what uh, the participation rates were showing you, even for the over 65s. But despite that, life expectancy has increased at such a tremendous pace uh, due to increases in, in uh, advances in science that the gap between life expectancy and the effective age of retirement has gone up almost linearly until about 2010, after which has stabilized a little bit um, as, as retirement ages were pushed up. But all of it means that the public expenditure on pensions um, and age-related expenses are really going nowhere except north. And here we tried to get a projection from the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility from uh, the UK. And this is a pre-pandemic chart. And Charles was uh, um, very clever and specific in making sure that we had a pre-pandemic chart in here to tell you that the, the, the projected rate of increase of debt before the pandemic was almost exponential. So in the UK, uh, deficits uh, and, and rising debt were already before the pandemic arising as far as we could see, as far as the eye could see. And most of this was due to age-related uh, expenditures. And the same story is true in most advanced economies, but perhaps one of the most striking charts comes from the CBO. Um, if you looked at this equivalent chart from 2019, uh, the entire level after 2020 would have been about 30% of GDP lower. What the pandemic has done is it has created that little hump that you see over there, but that massive increase in debt after that was intact in the 2019 version as well. All we have seen is a level shift up. The other interesting thing about this chart is that uh, while the Financial Times and most um, uh, uh, discussions from the IMF talk about incurring debt right now to uh, and, and then taking care of it later on. I think the, the difference that you see from here is in the past, whenever we've had episodes in which debt has risen quite significantly, uh, it's been uh, something that has gone straight back down up to wars, for example, which are fixed events, as is the pandemic, debt has gone down. But what follows from here is nothing of the sort. What follows from here is an ever increasing debt profile that we simply have not come to terms with. And so the question then is, how will we deal with that? So what we're, what we're trying to show in here, coming to the economic implications uh, of that and, and um, some of the ways in which they could be mitigated, what we're trying to get at is not only is this a story of relative friction between demographic cohorts, as Charles was saying, the old and the young uh, consume, but they don't really produce and hence are inflationary, whereas the working age population, at least the one that participates is disinflationary, um, that friction, along with the prospect of dealing with debt is what gives us a lot more confidence about inflation. Because ideally, you'd like to grow away debt. Um, and so periods of very strong growth, uh, uh, revenue generation allow debt to be retired, uh, not to be renewed. That is very unlikely because as, as we all know, uh, growth is going to be the sum of the uh, growth of the labor force um, and productivity. We, we do think productivity is going to rise, but you've got to look at it from two points of view. The first is that, yes, there is definitely a greater adoption of technology. But the second is, Charles and I expect a lot of the increase in productivity to also come from onshoring, which is not really a global optimum. If you are onshoring your production uh, because you have uh, less control over geopolitical events and you want to protect your supply chains a lot better, um, then the increase in productivity is, is almost a second best from an individual producer's point of view. And it's not clear that they will be able to absorb the cost entirely for themselves and may have to pass some of that on uh, further. So we do expect an increase in productivity. We don't think it will be overwhelming. In fact, when we look at Japan and we see the 2% increase in output per worker that Japan has seen over the last few decades, we think most advanced economies would be lucky to get to that level. But uh, we'll talk about that soon. So what remains then uh, is what uh, Milton Friedman famously called uh, uh, taxation without regulation. Inflation. It's unattractive, but necessary. We don't think central banks have the ability to aggressively raise interest rates to rein in inflation, not only because it is very upsetting as far as the administration 
um, and the prospect of a recession is concerned, but also because we've got an absolutely gigantic stockpile of debt. And that stockpile of debt means that uh, raising interest rates to trigger the sacrifice ratio and bring inflation down raises the threat of also financial damage which could, which could create uh, a debt problem. Um, the pandemic, we think, accelerates these stories, but I won't get into that in the interest of, of time and our discussion. The only point I wanted to make very quickly before handing it back to you is one of the main concerns from a demographic point of view is can India and Africa offset global aging? Numerically, yes. Economically, unfortunately, no. And that's for three reasons. Number one, um, if you look at where uh, growth in the labor force is still going to be abundant, it's in parts of the world that we have high economic hopes for, but they are not the major contributors to global GDP growth at, at this point in time. Second, if you decide to import capital uh, from the advanced economies, convert it into output and ship it back, that's something that China had a much bigger advantage in India might still have some. If you look at this beautiful chart um, uh, from about 2000 years, you see that China for most of history was the dominant economy in the world. Um, and it's only uh, 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 since the 1900s that we've gotten used to the United States being that and China clawing its way back. India used to be a quarter of the world's GDP before uh, its share started getting whittled, whittled down quite significantly after empire. But uh, the ability of the Indian policymakers at this point in time to resolve their differences and come out striding uh, is less convincing. It might take a little bit more change before we get into that. And the, the, the net migration story is turning south exactly at a time when we would want it to become a more expansionary force in equilibrating labor supply all across the world. So I'll, I'll leave it here with just one point uh, if it comes up in discussion, one of the key questions that we get is, well, why didn't any of this happen in Japan? And our simple argument uh, is that it was impossible for Japan to inflate when its demographic turnaround happened at the same time that China was busy disinflating the entire global economy. It simply could not stand in the tide of that. And so the conclusions, we think inflation is coming. We think the yield curve is uh, going to steepen further. It has already been doing so. Asset returns will be harder to extract. The inequality that demography created over the last 30 or 35 years will reverse, but in the context of low growth. And we think central bank independence will come under increasing threat because the administrations will not like any efforts to stop inflation by raising policy rates. But that's it from us. Thanks a lot, Charles. Thanks, Manoj. Uh, without further ado, let me give the floor to Ron uh, for the discussion. I don't think we can hear you wrong. The mic may. Ron is muted. You need to unmute him. Yeah. Uh, now, do you hear me? Yes, now it's, it works. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Francisco, and thank you, uh, Charles and uh, Manoj, for that those great presentations and for the for the book. So, what I'm going to give is not a uh, critique or review of the book, but uh, I'm going to look at some of the same issues from a different perspective, I will, let's say, a more demographic perspective. I'm not going to talk about inflation, but I'm going to focus on what I view as uh, fundamentals and direct consequences of demographic change. So uh, let me first say a word about the demographic transition. Um, this is a series of changes that Francisco already described that unfolds in a country 
in a population over a couple of centuries, very slow moving uh, in its totality. Uh, this is as a population moves from having many births and short life to having low fertility and long life. And these changes in the vital rates uh, bring changes in the population age distribution uh, with uh, changing shares of children and the elderly and in the working ages. In the middle of the transition, there's a period in which the share in the working ages grows uh, quite rapidly. And this boosts the growth rate of per capita income. And it is called the demographic dividend or window of opportunity. But then later in the transition, the share of elderly uh, rises and this reduces the growth rate of per capita income and it creates the stresses on societal support systems that uh, Charles and Monoj were just uh, describing. Now this is to just make this more concrete, uh, a, a typical pattern of the demographic transition. The general shape is very similar across uh, all populations. This happens to be Costa Rica, and this process would have started around 1900. And you see the rising life expectancy, and then 60 years later, beginning of declining fertility, changing age distribution. And what I want to emphasize is this middle period in which the share in working ages is rising rapidly. That's over a period of 50, 60 years. And uh, in terms of dependency ratios, we see the same 55 year period in which the total dependency ratio is falling. It's falling because youth dependency is falling and then it stops falling uh, because fertility stops declining and because the old age dependency ratio begins to rise. And so uh, we have different countries located at different points in this process of the demographic transition. Uh, way down here, we have a country like Niger that hasn't started the transition process yet, so far as fertility is concerned. Uh, somewhere in here, we have India that has, uh, is well through the fertility decline process, but is still experiencing the age, uh, the demographic dividend phase. And then just past this point, we have China that has started uh, population aging. And then farther along here, we'd have uh, the European countries and, uh, and uh, East Asia, Japan, and, and so on. Okay, well, let's move on. As now our task is to try to interpret these demographic changes in terms of economic consequences. And I want to start by looking at global GDP uh, and its trends and the role of population. And for this, I'm going to use age profiles from the National Transfer Accounts Project. We've seen a couple of those in uh, Charles's uh, talk, and I'll show a little more detail. In this project, labor income is wages and salaries plus two thirds of self employment income, including farmers and shopkeepers and so on. And it's averaged across males, females, and those with zeros. And then consumption is household consumption, which we impute to individuals in each household, and then in-kind government transfers like public, public education, public health care, long-term care, and so on. So this is what the labor income age profiles look like once they're standardized by dividing by average labor income uh, in the middle years. And you see the high income countries here, uh, kids start working later, and then you see this uh, earlier and more complete retirement compared to other countries. And the orange here is the low income. This would, for example, be uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, children working much longer, uh, and then the elderly continuing to work into old age as they do in the lower uh, middle income countries because they don't really have uh, a choice. 
Uh, okay, now what, what I want to do is use these to find the effect of population on global GDP, abstracting from changes over time in productivity and so on. And to do this, we, we've, we've estimated these profiles for 196 countries now. For each country, we calculate effective labor uh, by multiplying that age profile times the population age distribution and then adding it up. That's what we call effective labor. We keep the age profile of labor income fixed and, and look at the effect of different uh, population age distributions in different periods. So we do this for the past, the present, and the future. And then uh, we add these up across all countries in the world. And it's sort of self-weighting because these labor income profiles are expressed in real uh, monetary terms. Um, and that gives us a total global labor income and its changes over time insofar as they're driven by uh, just the population age distribution and size. And um, if we assume that labor income is a fixed share of GDP, then they grow at the same rate and we can use the growth rate of labor income uh, to indicate the role of demography in boosting uh, GDP growth. So that's what we will do. And here are some results of this exercise. So we look at four periods, 1950 to 75, 75 to 2000, 2000 to 2020, and then projected forward. And we're looking here at historical and projected global GDP uh, growth rate. This is the growth rate. And uh, these are from standard economic uh, sources, historical sources for this historical data. And then this is a projection of our own, assuming that we project forward the effective labor force growth. And then we're assuming that productivity growth occurs at the same, continues to occur at the same rate it did in the past 20 years. Well, uh, okay. What we see is, yes, we expect a decline by about 1% per year in global GDP growth due to uh, the kinds of demographic changes that Charles and Manoj were just uh, describing. Uh, so relative to the past 20 years, we expect a substantial decline. Now, um, that's the GDP growth rate. This is what the global labor supply growth rate looks like from our analysis. And what is striking here is just the extreme drop off in the global, uh, the growth rate of the global labor supply productivity weighted. Um, and uh, so it's down to only 0.15% per year. And we can now ask, well, what proportion of global uh, GDP growth was due, has been due and will be due to uh, the labor force growth. Well, that's this calculation. And here what's striking is that in the last uh, quarter century of the 20th century, uh, 1975 to 2000, more than half of GDP growth was due to growth in the effective labor supply. But in the next 40 years, this is going to be less than a tenth of uh, global GDP grew growth due to that same source. Uh, well, that is indeed a huge change. Uh, we could call it uh, a great demographic reversal. The era of population-driven global GDP growth uh, has come to an end. It's not going to be true of the future. It was true of the past. And why has it uh, dropped so much? Well, there continues to be very rapid labor force growth, population growth in lower income, uh, low income and some low middle income countries, uh, particularly of course in Sub-Saharan Africa. But 
in these areas, productivity is very low. So the labor force growth has very little impact on global GDP growth, as uh, Charles or Manoj uh, pointed out. Uh, on the other hand, in the countries with high productivity, the high income countries in Europe, North America, East Asia, and so on, uh, the labor force growth is slow or negative. And so th that's the demography that has the biggest impact. And the result is this very low share of uh, labor force growth in explaining future GDP growth. And then finally, we can look here at the growth rate of per capita income, global per capita income. And here the story is a little different. And personally, I care more about the per capita GDP than I do about the total GDP growth rate, because this is something closer to individual uh, well-being. But what we see here is that uh, for the next 40 years, the growth rate of per capita GDP is going to be somewhat more rapid. Uh, so far as the demography is concerned, than it had been in that last quarter of the 20th century. And that's because the denominator is growing. It's true that the numerator, GDP, is growing a lot more slowly, but so is the denominator, which is population. Okay. Um, now, moving on to some other topics. Most of the worries we have about population aging are not due to what's going on on the production side, on the output side uh, for the economy, but rather they're mostly due to the redistribution from those in the working ages to uh, children and the elderly. Because as was pointed out, the age the, the shape of the age profile of labor income is very different than the shape of the age profile of consumption, which we're going to look at in a moment. Children and the elderly consume much more than they produce. It's true that asset income uh, helps pay for the consumption by the elderly, but in many countries, including most European, many European countries, uh, it's really public transfers that uh, pay for, in a number of cases, the entire uh, consumption by the elderly. Um, and that means that as populations grow older, it exerts tremendous pressure on the working age population. So those public transfers include public pensions, public health care, public long-term care, and so on. So here is what the uh, consumption by age profiles look like. And as Charles showed a moment ago, in the high income countries, you have this striking pattern of rapidly rising consumption by age. And that's a pattern that has intensified over past uh, decades. In the US, the ratio of consumption by an 80 year old to a 20 year old has doubled over recent uh, decades. Okay. Um, and you see that this is much less so in the uh, lower income countries in Africa, for example, and consumption is fairly flat across age in the middle income countries. Okay, so why are these redistributions a concern? Well, with population aging, there are more elderly consuming more than they produce, and there are fewer workers producing more than they consume, and something has to give. Either the workers have to make bigger transfers in the future, for example, through higher taxes, or the elderly are going to receive smaller benefits, uh, perhaps lower pension benefits or uh, later retirement or other sorts of things. So this is the main concern, really, I think, with uh, population aging. The support ratio is the simplest approach to taking into account this redistribution between the earning of the income and its consumption. Uh, the support ratio doesn't include these public and private transfers explicitly, but it does reflect them implicitly. 
and allows us to see to what degree they're going to be a, a problem. And so the support ratio is the ratio of available workers to needed consumption. So we calculate it as the ratio of effective labor, as I described earlier, to effective consumers based on these age profiles I've shown you, multiplied times the population age distributions and, and added up. And uh, okay, returning to the example of Costa Rica with which I started, um, here we have between 1970 and uh, 2025 or so, over a 55 year period, we have this first demographic dividend in which the support ratio is increasing by about seven tenths of a percent per year. And then we have uh, that followed by population aging, which is continuing for a long time. But uh, here over the next 35 years, we have a decrease that's tending to reduce uh, income per equivalent consumer by four tenths of a percent per year. And the net swing is uh, over 1% per year. And that is enough to be uh, troublesome. Now, again, we can locate uh, this, the general shape of the transition is the same across countries. And here we have Niger, for example, India, China, has just started its uh, population aging in the sense of a declining support ratio. And here we have the high income countries. Now, this is looking at China more specifically. And China is, has an extraordinarily rapid and deep uh, demographic transition. And these effects are exaggerated in China of the support ratio swings and its rate of change, which is the definition of the demographic dividend. Um, for example, if we compare uh, the average of 1981 to 1990, uh, that's in this period, uh, it was rising at almost 1.4% per year. That is boosting the growth rate of income per equivalent consumer by that much. And then if we look at the next decade, it's going to fall at more than 1% per year, which is uh, uh, quite a lot. And then the swing between these two is 2.5% 2 per year in growth of income per equivalent consumer. Well, that is a huge uh, economic shock. And again, I would say, yes, that is worthy of the uh, name great demographic uh, reversal. If we look uh, more broadly at the parts of the world, uh, the, yes, you might say a great reversal, but it's a more mixed story, a little bit less clear. Because if we look at the um, high income countries, the blue line here, uh, okay, they reached their highest support ratio, maybe early uh, 2005 or so, and they've been experiencing uh, aging on average for 15 years, uh, and it will intensify in the future. Not very different story for the upper, upper middle income uh, countries, the red line here, um, but a very different story, in fact, for the low income and lower middle income countries. They're still in the dividend phase, as we see down in the lower panel. They still have a positive demographic dividend at the same time that the high income and uh, upper middle income countries have very negative uh, demographic dividend due to population aging. So as I say, it's a bit of a mixed story. Now, I want to uh, move on now to what happens. Th these, everything I've done so far is emphasizing labor income as the source of income. But of course, not all income comes from labor. About a third of it comes from capital. Working age people bring their labor to the economy. The elderly don't bring much labor, but they don't come empty handed. The elderly come with a lot of capital, with assets they've accumulated over a lifetime. Um, and this capital then 
uh, raises the productivity and wages of workers if it's uh, invested domestically. So uh, how does population age distribution affect this amount of capital? Well, in most economies, it is the elderly who hold most of the assets and capital. This is partly because they've saved throughout their lives, but it's also because they've inherited. Uh, it's because of changes in taxation. It's because of uh, changing relative asset prices and so on. And these then are all affected in uh, an age profile of asset holdings. So let me just flip down here. Uh, this is looking at the US, the value of asset holdings by age over three decades. Each of these little gray lines is uh, an age profile of asset holdings standardized so we can compare the age shapes and the red line is the average and you can see that uh, it is the elderly particularly after 60 or so who are the major asset holders and our argument is that the more elderly there are the more people uh, who have accumulated assets over their lives there are relative to the workers and that in itself will raise the capital intensity in the economy the capital amount of capital available for each worker, and that is going to then uh, raise productivity in the economy. It's going to raise the wage rate and reduce the interest rate. So these uh, are simulations of this using more national transfer accounts data for different parts of the world. Uh, here, uh, taking uh, the level of 2015 as one, uh, there will be something like a 20 to 40 percent increase in the capital labor ratio in in the high income countries. Um, there will be uh, something like a 50 to uh, 100 and uh, 100 percent increase in that ratio in Latin American countries. There will be something like a 10 to uh, 60 percent increase in Asia, particularly East Asia. Um, now, in a, a sort of standard Cobb-Douglas production function world, uh, this ratio of capital to labor and its change will translate one-to-one -one into a change in the ratio of real wages to real interest rates. And so these are also saying that uh, wages are going to be rising relative to interest rates in these economies in the future. Now, this isn't, uh, I think, a very controversial idea. I think probably most economists would say there will be capital intensification, a demand for uh, wealth holdings by uh, funded pension funds as the uh, increased saving for longer life and so on. So from that, uh, I expect rising real wages, higher productivity, lower interest rates, and these together, I expect, will introduce, uh, will reduce income inequality. So uh, the conclusions will just be a summary of what I've already said. Uh, China reached a real demographic uh, great reversal in 2013, slowing growth of GDP and income per consumer. The rest of the world's population is a bit of a mix, with the low income countries benefiting from demographic dividends and the high income countries seeing continuing aging. Um, relative to that last quarter of the 20th century, future population change is going to slow GDP growth quite substantially by more than one and a half percent per year. But per capita GDP is going to grow a little bit more rapidly than it did then. I expect interest rates will continue to fall as more elderly bring more assets to the market. Real wages will rise uh, due to more capital per worker, at least uh, in relation to interest rates. And perhaps optimistically, I expect this to lead to reductions in income inequality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh...
so this is uh, certainly important as a kickstart also as a discussion to Charles and Manoj. Uh, maybe we'll uh, collect uh, some questions before we give back the floor to Charles and Manoj. And uh, in addition to what uh, Ron has raised, uh, which is, I will summarize as, is, is the story only about China or not? Uh, I will say I have two points about, uh, let's say, the speed of change of demography. And one uh, has already been mentioned by, I think, Charles and Manoj, which is, uh, okay, we in, in this kind of slow-moving demography story, COVID came in, and suddenly we have uh, a crisis which was uh, a little bit like... Uh, the pre-demographic transition crisis. What, what's, what's that going to change in your long-term story? And the second story, I'd like to, to think a little bit more about uh, uh, your view on migration and why migration uh, is, cannot play a solution. And so why is demography taken as exogenous when we look at the national level? especially of smaller countries demographically, like the UK or even the, Un the European Union, given that, uh, I mean, Africa, as you uh, well shown, uh, it is growing. Why don't we see migration as a solution? But maybe I, I would like to rest with you and ask uh, the audience whether there are other questions uh, to the speakers. Uh, and you can, uh, you are allowed to speak uh, or please speak, but if you, if you don't like or you, you're not in a position to speak, please uh, uh, write your question in the chat. Can I ask a question? Go on, Guido. Guido. Um, uh, thank you for these very interesting uh, talks. Uh, two questions. Uh, the first is, uh, uh, given the long time horizon, besides uh, uh, immigration, I would expect uh, labor saving technologies to be an important uh, 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 issue going forward. We complain now that robots are taking away jobs, but maybe they will be a solution to this problem going forward. The second is a comment that's more specifically to what Charles and Manoj have said, uh, and uh, it concerns inflation. So uh, if uh, the view that we will have a debt problem is correct, uh, this doesn't mean that uh, inflation will be the result. Whether we will see inflation or not will be a policy choice. And there are other ways to deal with uh, the uh, excessive debt problem, including debt restructuring. And so what makes you think that uh, we will see inflation rather than other ways of handling the uh, excessive debt, if that turns out to be a problem? Thanks. Let's take another question and then we give the floor back to speakers. Can I put a question? Franco. Yeah. Um, thank you for your speeches. Um, one question on inflation, uh, following also Guido's question, suppose that inflation is chosen or it's endogenously the result of this large debt problem. How can inflation can, re can really reduce the, the real value of the debt? Is that possible given the reaction of interest rates and so on and so forth? So is it possible to really use inflation to reduce debt? Thank you. Maybe we start we, we, we start with Charles and Manoji and, and see whether Ron would like to add. Please. Okay, perhaps I might start. I'd like to start by saying that uh, we support everything that Ron has said. And one of the things that we find remarkable is given the strength uh, of the demographic changes that Ron actually set out, how little attention has been paid to demography uh, by macroeconomists over the de recent years. And that actually, in some ways, is the, uh, uh, I think, the strength of our book in that we've tried to bring demography back into the mainstream of economics. 
from which it had more or less been completely been lost. Um, now, I'm going to leave the migration arguments to, um, to Manoj. On labor saving technology, uh, one of the strong points that we would make uh, is that uh, the key issue is going to be the very large number of medically dependent age old. And robots can't help that all that much. There's been an interesting recent study by the NBER about the use of robots in Japanese care homes. And they do help. Um, they help with things like uh, providing uh, sensors for when beds get wetted, uh, sensors uh, for other purposes as well, and uh, mechanisms for lifting the old out of beds and out of their wheelchairs into their baths. But the study also showed that they had no effect whatsoever on the number of uh, nurses and other carers involved in those care homes. And one of the things that I would particularly emphasize, um, I, among other things, um, my brother died of, of Alzheimer's not so long ago, uh, is that what you really need uh, if you're old uh, is human relationships, human empathy. And the empathy quotient of a robot is exactly zero. The idea that you can replace ca human carers by robots in care homes, you really only have to go into a dementia ward and sort of be aware of your surroundings. And you will realize very soon that the idea that robots can help in that respect is, is, is just wrong. And indeed, in what we claim in our book is we're going to need an awful lot of improvements in robots and productivity in repetitious jobs elsewhere in order to release carers whom there will have to be a massive great additional number uh, to look after uh, the ages. Now, I think, we, I can't remember, I think it was Mark. Marco, uh, both Marco and Guido, it's lovely to see both, um, uh, asked, well, you don't have to have inflation, and you're absolutely right. There are other ways of dealing with debt. Uh, what we argue on political grounds, and again, uh, it's a political economy argument, uh, is that the other ways of dealing uh, with uh, the problem of the debt, uh, raising taxes, lowering the benefits to the aged, uh, defaulting on your debt, um, uh, or raising interest rates, which could have the effect of in introducing a financial collapse, are also politically unpleasant. The great advantage of inflation is, from a political point of view, is you don't actually have to do anything. You don't have to do anything nasty. And every politician will always claim all the time that they're totally opposed to inflation, but they will undertake sort of policies to optimize their re-election. And that we believe will actually include allowing a degree of inflation. Now, Marco then said, well, yes, but does that really reduce the debt if expectations and, um, uh, and interest rates rise? Well, and we have at the moment, I think, a world in which uh, expectations are supposedly, in the standard phrase, well, well anchored, which means that if we do get inflation, everybody now is simply not prepared for it. And inflation at any rate over the first probably five or 10 years will be very largely unexpected and will have the effect of reducing um, uh, the debt ratio quite largely. One of the sad effects of current policies has been that the QE policies have reduced the duration of the debt so much that actually uh, that in turn will mean that when inflation rises, interest rates on a much larger proportion of the debt will rise much quicker. Uh, I think that uh, if our concern about inflation rises, uh, rising uh, actually turns out to be true, uh, 
which of course it may not do, who knows, we don't have a crystal ball, that if inflation does rise, the QE policies over recent years will, I think, in hindsight, be, t uh, be regarded as, uh, in some respects, a disaster. We should have taken the advantage of hugely low interest rates to undertake as, as long a lengthening the effective duration of our debt as we possibly could have. We've done the opposite with QE. But I'm now going to turn over to Manoj to deal with the migration point, why we can't have more migration. Um, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a very fair question. And if you, if you were a, a benevolent dictator from a global standpoint, I think that's exactly what you would do. You would uh, raise all the barriers, remove all the barriers, uh, equalize uh, skills and wages. Unfortunately, that's not the way elections have gone at all. So it's, from our standpoint, it's simply a political argument that says, if you decided to uh, increase the inflow of immigration, you would be doing yourselves political uh, harm rather than any benefits. It is possible that they will be lifted once the problems of the shortages of labor workers for uh, carers is revealed, but that's still ahead of us. It has to reach a critical level before we think we can get to it. It may happen, but we don't see it happening. Um, I'll have two or three short points to add in here. Um, I think um, one of the questions was, well, why not have debt restructuring? Rather than the political standpoint, I'll tell you from a financial standpoint that it would be an absolutely frightening case and would lead to dramatic changes in the way people perceive risk premium. And if those risk premium were added to such a heavily indebted world, I think financial markets have every chance to come to a standstill. So if, if you have a large debtor nation like Japan or the United States going down the path of debt restructuring, the first question that everyone will ask is why won't everyone else do it? And I think that's quite difficult. On the question of inflation, I think that the, you, you, you might turn out to be absolutely right, that inflation does get priced in um, and uh, hence do, doesn't really reduce the burden of debt if we get to that point. But one of the chapters that we've got in which Charles uh, was very good in pointing out the alternatives to debt financed um, financing is something that we think will require something like that uh, for policymakers to take on. It's not until debt financing becomes really expensive that the benefits of equity financing or nominal GDP coupon payments will be looked at very seriously. And the last point I'd make is in, in some senses, central banks holding such a huge chunk of government debt effectively means that I think they're turning them personally uh, into variable coupon consoles. So regardless of whether the debt is fully priced into um, uh, coupon payments or not, even if it's rolled over completely, part of that coupon payment will be made to the, uh, to the central bank um, and clearly back to the treasury as profits are, are, are recycled, which means you will get some kind of an inflation premium even if you get that story priced in. But keep in mind again, that we've always got the threat of financial repression. Others have said that this is difficult to do in a globalized world, but there is a huge home bias to investing. And wherever you've had financial repression, you've managed to keep uh, inflation and nominal GDP growth from being fully priced into to coupon payments. Thanks, Manoj. Uh, Ron, uh, I was going to ask uh, whether you have uh, anything to add, and I was going to challenge you on uh, on whether COVID is a minor blip in the long term of demography and what do you think about the migration solution? Mute. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll speak only briefly because the main show is Charles and Manoj. But uh, first on COVID, um, well, I hesitate to say this because for many people and for, and for societies, COVID has been a, a, a horrible thing and many have died and so on. But in terms of sort of stepping back uh, demographically, the demographic impact is very small. So in the US where it's hit very hard, um, there, we would ordinarily have 3 million deaths this year. Instead, uh, um, we had uh, about 10% more than that. We had uh, about 300,000 uh, additional. Since then, we've had another couple of hundred thousand. But it's, it's a relatively minor um, uh, increase in mortality and we expect it's going to be over in uh, 
uh, I'd say another six months, something like that. Uh, life expectancy will have dropped maybe uh, 1.5 to two years due to COVID, but then go right back to where it would have been before. Um, so demographically, it, in, in terms of the mortality side, it's just great suffering, but not a great uh, uh, impact. It will barely be noticeable in, in demographic charts. Spanish flu, uh, well, the, the, the influenza epidemic of 1918, that reduced life expectancy by 15 years in the US, much more uh, serious. Now, whether there'll be an effect on fertility remains to be seen. So yes, I think COVID is not going to be a big demographic uh, turning point unless it turns out to be a much greater long-term problem than we think now. Um, immigration, uh, well, it's so complicated in Europe. In the US, however, I've been involved in a number of group studies of the economic impact of immigration and I've worked on the fiscal impacts myself. Um, I think on net it is positive, but it's, uh, uh, it's despite uh, uh, negative, you know, it raises costs to public education and so on. In the long term, it's a big plus, but on a per capita basis for the domestic population, it really doesn't make very much difference one way or the other. That's the conclusion that I reach on the basis of these studies. It has small effects on the labor market and it has small effects on the long-term fiscal balance on once you look at it in the basis of you know, an average individual in the society. So uh, yes, I agree with what uh, Manoj said, uh, uh, a rational global planner would uh, have reduce barriers to migration and let it rip. And it would be great, it would have big effects on GDP and so on, um, but most of those are probably approved of migrants. Anyway, okay. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. you. I, I so we, we have uh, additional questions. I have a question from uh, Andrea Papetti. Uh, could you please speak? Yes. Hello. Uh, good evening. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Andrea Papetti from uh, Bank of, I of Italy. Um, so one question for Charles and uh, uh, Manoj is, is that one, one of the standard view I um, happen to, to hear is that um, if the profile of assets by age that uh, Ronald Lee was, uh, was showing us is, is true, then uh, aging means uh, uh, that capital will be uh, more abundant in the economy, and in particular, the real interest rate will be lower, or if you want the natural interest rate. And you know, the standard view is that then the um, central bank is not able to, uh, to go as low as the natural rate, and then this turn out to be uh, disinflationary rather than inflationary. So I, I would like to hear what's your view on this, on this, uh, on this story. And then I have, uh, I will say a rather technical question for, for uh, uh, Professor Ro Ronald Lee, uh, because the, the profile of consumption from the national transfer account looks to me uh, quite different from what we are used to in, in economics, I think. Um, and, and I was wondering whether this comes from the fact that the, um, the data set does not take into account a uh, court effect, probably. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Let, let us take uh, another couple of questions, if there are questions before. Can I ask a second question, or am I abusing the time? One question is fine. So uh, to, to Charles and Manoj, I, I thought that uh, the picture described by Ron Lee is actually much less uh, concerning than the one that you described. Per capita GDP does not fall by much. Uh, the real interest rate drops, which uh, makes the public debt sustainable, more sustainable. So aren't you exaggerating the risk of a debt crisis and inflation based on uh, the numbers that Ron presented, I would walk away very reassured. Okay, a, a last question before we give back the floor. No, then let's uh, let's ask Charles and Manoj 
I mean, you had at least two big questions. Um, okay. Um, on real interest rates, uh, it is certainly possible that real interest rates will remain very low. We feel that the route whereby the real interest rates will remain very low is that inflation will rise relative to nominal rates. And that inflation will rise, nominal rates will rise a bit, but because of political forces, not as much as uh, inflation. So that we think it is perfectly likely that real interest rates, particularly at the short end, will, will remain low. Uh, one of the points that we would make uh, is that in all the arguments about um, capital, uh, the housing market tends to be uh, not sufficiently considered. Uh, and one of the features about aging uh, is that the old, and I can vouch for this, do not like moving. We have paid off our mortgages and we don't have to move. Uh, that means that although uh, the population growth will go down, there will still be a considerable demand uh, for additional housing uh, because um, the old will be sitting, there'll be a, a massive increasing misallocation of room space with the old sitting in houses which have now become much too large for them um, and the young having to, in order to, to uh, get a house of their own, uh, will have to will have to get a house of their own. Actually, one of the other things that I wanted to ask Ron at some stage is that one of the issues in um, in demography, which has not been sufficiently considered uh, in macroeconomics, I wonder if it's been considered sufficiently in demography, has been the trend rising age age of marriage and the trend rising age. Um, uh, of having the first child, which in turn is partly related uh, to the cost of housing, uh, which has gone up because although the, pop working, the size of the population growth is going down, uh, the need for housing has not been going down anything like so fast uh, for the reasons um, that I was indicating. Uh, now, about the Ron being correct about uh, the per capita income growth not falling anything like so fast. That is true. Uh, but think of the case of Japan. Uh, a lot of people have argued that Japan is not doing terribly well. But actually, in terms of per capita income, Japan has not been doing at all badly because the productivity per worker in Japan has actually been rising um, faster than it has in almost every other country. Uh, and again, that's not, it. I, if you look at the sort of the, the, the feelings about, are you doing well? People don't say Japan is doing well, where actually on a per capita basis it is. So if people are, are worried about sort of aggregates, not dividing it by population, then we're all going to feel that we're doing less well, though actually, for the per capita basis, we won't be doing that badly. And again, a point there, which again Ron pointed out, is it's a redistribution problem. Uh, although the workers will, um, will be more productive and will have higher uh, real wages, a significant additional proportion of that is going to have to be taxed to pay for the pension and care and medical benefits of the old. So the redistribution problem uh, is going to be quite a large one. And even though we think that the politicians are not going to be brave enough to raise taxes sufficiently, uh, there has got to be a sufficient increase in the tax rates. There's got to be uh, in order to provide the, the, the support and care uh, for the old. So you've got a redistributional problem, and you, if you like, you've got an aggregate problem. Although, as Guido, you're absolutely right that the, the outlook on a per capita basis is not nearly so bad as it is on an aggregate basis. Um, I would only add two small things. One is um, I haven't I haven't looked into this statistically, so I'm I'm reluctant to make any broad claims on it. 
but uh, when when we do present any of the thesis about where productivity is going, where uh, inflation is going, to people who manage um, pensions, I think there's a lot of sweat in the room. Um, part of the reason might be that the ability to generate returns, which have led to the stockpile of assets that the elderly hold today, have over the last few decades been under far more benign circumstances. Uh, if we are right in saying that inflation is going to make that story a little bit harder uh, to deal with, then I think coming to the table with uh, uh, a persistent or a consistent uh, profile of asset holdings for the elderly might prove to be a little bit difficult. And the last point I'd add is, if there is no inflation, if you're wrong on inflation and uh, uh, real interest rates remain very low, then I think we are very close to the MMT world and then who, who is worried? I think everything should flow exactly as you said. But if you do get that stockpile of inflation and the CBO projections and the OBR projections on age-related spending and debt are uh, the right ones, I think the combination is the one that's toxic and the one that we still have to worry about, even if real interest rates uh, are not really the serious problem. Wrong. Um, so let me say uh, two things. First, uh, in response to Charles, yes, demographers have thought a great deal about rising age at marriage and particularly rising age at first birth. Uh, they've thought about these in relation to the, the level and trends in fertility. So, <clears throat> One effect of the rising age at first birth is to, in a way, uh, distort our measures of fertility. So it, uh, it, it when we look at total fertility rates, which is our usual uh, measure, those are depressed by uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 uh, births per woman uh, in a transitory way. In the long run, those women may end, they're starting later, they may end up having just as many children as, as before, but the, the birth rate today <clears throat> is depressed. And that's some chunk, as Francisco has worked on this as well, some chunk of that, uh, of the low fertility in the US and Europe and Japan and so on is due to this postponement of, of childbearing rather than necessarily a reduction in how many will eventually be had. Uh, of course, it still has the same effect on the rate of growth of the population and the labor force. Um, now, Andrea Papetti asked me a question which I didn't, I, I, I couldn't <clears throat> grasp, and I wonder whether he could ask it again, or perhaps Francisco, you could paraphrase. I think if you could uh, yes, tell us you. a bit more on how you compute your uh, age profiles in the NTA approach. The, it was a technical well, point. If, okay, if, the if, age if, profile. If, if I can add just uh, briefly, so. Yeah, but I, just to say it very yeah. briefly, sorry, uh, Andrea. Yeah, so just the consumption profile, it seems to me that it's not quite um, uh, the same like uh, what we see in the consensus, uh, I think in the, in economics. So it's a, it's a growing more than usual. <laughs> I will say uh, at at later ah. ages, and I was wondering whether court effect maybe might might be the reason that are not taken into account um, probably in the national transfer account. Yeah. Well, the the profiles I showed you are cross sectional. Um, they are done in a way that is consistent with national income and product accounts for each country, but. Uh, is there a difference between the cross-section and longitudinal? Yes. So in longitudinal, they would be rising uh, much more rapidly than we see them rising in the cross-section. Why are they rising so fast? Well, a good part of that is because these include in-kind government transfers, particularly healthcare. I was going to, there was another slide, but I, there wasn't time to show it. Uh, showing that, for example, in the US, but this is true in some other countries as well, uh, a big part of that increase at older ages is due to public health care spending. And then in the US, a big part is due to growing private health care spending as well. Um, and uh, so some of it uh, wouldn't be 
Well, it'll be subject to a different calculus than ordinary uh, economic calculations of optimal uh, consumption over, over the life cycle, when some of it is coming through public transfers and some of it is related to increasing healthcare needs and so on. Uh, that's the best I can do. I hope that's of some help. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So our time is over unless there is a very quick and pressing question uh, or comment from the speakers. I'd like to warmly thank our speakers. I'd like to advertise the great demographic reversal by Charles Goodhart and Manoj Pradhan. I'm sure you can get it uh, via Amazon in any possible way. Uh, and I, I, I'd like to thank Ron uh, for his renewed meeting between uh, uh, economists and demographers. Actually, Ron, uh, I think, uh, might claim to be both, uh, also by his uh, PhD. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank in particular as a kind of a, as a demographer at Bocconi, the, 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 the stimulus that uh, Charles and Manoj gave us to think about uh, uh, how to embed population processes into uh, macro, but I would say general uh, economic thinking. Uh, so uh, let me close by uh, pointing you to the EGIA website uh, and uh, the next event at EGIA will be uh, an EGIA seminar by Arash Chetty on May 4th, 5.30 p.m. CET. Thank you very much for your participation. Thanks for having us.